Pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Take a roll, please. O'Connor? Here. Morissette? Here. Alms absent. McCormick? Here. Weber? Here. Hoggett? Here. Hall? Here. Okay, discussion of possible action on Hanley Road Traffic Study, Carmichael Road to Heritage Boulevard. Tom? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to do a real brief introduction, and then Glenn has a PowerPoint, uh, and you should have a hard copy of that. But uh, And for the viewers on the television as well, but uh, some concerns were voiced last spring by a homeowners association group from Red Cedar Canyon. A uh, copy of that letter's uh, on your table there. It was basically some concerns, excuse me, concerns relative to turn lanes, crosswalks, uh, some truck traffic, because it is up by the business park there, and some intersection. Um, since then, the council has given direction to staff to add Hanley Road from Carmichael to Heritage Boulevard to the 2018 street improvement project. And that project is basically a two inch mill and overlay. Both schedules kind of came together and the council ordered uh, in November a traffic study as long as we were doing Hanley Road as part of our 2018 project. Council directed a traffic study be done and authorized that last month. And that's what we're here to discuss tonight. Um, the original concerns were discussed at both public safety committee meeting maybe twice or once for sure and it was also discussed at a public works committee meeting. So. Um, that's, that said, um, we've also uh, um, talked with Bill Alms briefly here the other day, and I think Bill's got a couple of emails uh, that he has passed on to you as well. Um, and just an introduction for Glenn and for those at home too, uh, Glenn has been very involved with things relative to traffic here in Hudson. Uh, he's looked at some of the intersections along Carmichael Road um, from the dog track area all the way up north through I-94 as far as the signals. He's also reviewed um, both the traffic study when Carmichael Ridge development first came in. He reviewed that traffic study on behalf of the city. He's also reviewed the St. Croix Meadows, Meadows development, uh, possible development there. He's reviewed that study. He's also the lead person in the corridor study on Carmichael Road, which is from South Limits all the way through town to the northerly limits. And so Glenn's real familiar with this entire area. So I guess um, with that, we'll let Glenn pre do his presentation on some options in looking at Hanley Road. And I guess what we would look from council tonight is some direction relative to those options because we are, um, the proposed schedule at this point is we're in the plan prep mode. So plans and specs are being prepared. We're hoping to come to the last council meeting in January for approval of those plans and then advertise and go into the bidding mode from then. So that's another reason why we recommended having this joint meeting is so we could go forward and kind of keep that proposed schedule intact. With that, I'll turn it over to Glenn Van Warmer from SEH. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. We appreciate the, the special meeting just to handle this, but as you see, we're kind of tight on the schedule for getting our plans prepared, so we need to have a discussion and some decisions. <coughs> um, my PowerPoint here. There we go. These are some of the concerns that the people brought from Red, Can Red Cedar Canyon brought up. I won't go through them all, but basically it, it's the trail crossings, the lack of left turn lanes, truck traffic, uh, and if you've been on the road, you recognize that these are really concerns. They're not just made up. They're not somebody's imagination. Uh, one of the first things that we've done, and most people do, is they look at the easy solutions. One would be, why don't we just paint a crosswalk at O'Neill? Another one was, uh, we could add a trail on the north side, and people wouldn't have to cross the road. Uh, or we could create a two-lane section get rid of the four lanes, make it a little bit easier to travel that way, and add bike lanes. And I looked at some of those, and I, I thought they'd be nice too, but then I remember what Murphy's Laws are, and that said if a solution to a problem looks easy, it's probably the wrong solution. 
And the best solution is seldom easy. And that's really, as we've gotten into this, those have really been true. And the third one of Murphy's is, Murphy was an optimist. Just a couple of quick facts on crosswalks. Uh, so you don't just think we can just put in a crosswalk and everybody will be safe. This is based on 900 accidents in 2015. And it comes out of, out of Minnesota, but it's basically the same type of crash as we see on the Wisconsin crash facts. 26% 26 of the pedestrian injured were crossing without a crosswalk, but 38% of those that were injured were in a crosswalk. And so just putting in a crosswalk doesn't provide immediate protection for a pedestrian. Uh, the, by far, and this has been proven unfortunately many times, is the most dangerous street for a pedestrian to cross is a four-lane undivided roadway. There are a number of reasons why, but a lot of it is they've got to do across four lanes. You've got to look this way for two lanes of traffic, and when you find a gap, you look for two lanes that way, or you just walk out and hope that four lanes of traffic will all see you and stop. And if a truck in the right lane stops and you step out, that doesn't mean that the guy in the left lane is going to stop for you. So it's, it's a hazardous place to cross, and we struggle trying to figure out how to make four lanes safer for pedestrians. The other couple of facts that are interesting is that there's a lot of failure to yield and intention on the motorist parts where the motorist was the one that created the problem. 60% of them are that, which means our job is to get rid of that distraction to make sure that he is focused on where the pedestrian is crossing. But then also 26% of the crashes are attributed to the pedestrian's actions. And some of those are when you put in a crosswalk, they assume that they can just step right out and do it. If you watch uh, Cascade Avenue in front of the uh, U University of Wisconsin, River Falls there, the kids walk right out. And we did a lot of work down there to try and say, well, if they're going to walk out in front, we should at least channel them to a specific crossing. And it's been fairly successful, but they're still summing away and walking out or not looking. Uh, so we have those kinds of problems. The last fact which will enter on Hanley is that 31% of motors involved a turning movement, turning left or right at an intersection. And so. With those in mind, we start looking at crosswalks in general. They really need to be part of a planned system, not just put in. If, if, uh, if they're in a spot where people, where a driver expects them to be, they're much safer. You also need to not just let them run out into the street, but have what we call ADA compliant. And that means have the ramp, have a landing area, have them so that they are just as safe as we can make each and every one of them. Uh, we, we say that the motorist and the pedestrian should see, be able to see eye to eye. Doesn't mean that you'll be able to look at a, a, somebody driving a truck, but at least if you can see his face and he can see you, then we've got the start of a very safe crossing. If we obstruct that somehow, then we've started to lose our ability to make the crossing safe. And they should also be at expected locations. Uh, we usually we see pedestrians crossing at crosswalks and that's one of the reasons why we have problems when they cross somewhere else but also they should be at a place where you would expect to see crossing expect to see pedestrians crossing and you can also put in too many crosswalks if you go through Amory and Keller you see that they've got uh, like 80 crosswalks I'm exaggerating but they got every both sides of every intersection marked with a crosswalk and by the time you get to the seventh block you have said oh I haven't seen one yet and uh, the, you also would like to make sure that when you put a crosswalk in, you do have some use of it so that occasionally you see a pedestrian there. Otherwise, you just lose, you, you won't even look for a pedestrian because you've never seen one. One of the other quick solutions was why don't we just put a trail on the north side and then you won't have to cross over to get to the trail that's now on the south side. Well, if you, if you look at the road at Hanley going through that cut, it's actually offset and there's more room between the curve of the road on the south side than the north side. And if we put a trail in on the north side and got the the boulevard and then the eight-foot walk we would end up about six to fourteen feet from the rock cut. And if you go out there and look that's where the rocks start to end up on the trail or on the ground. Uh, and one thing I always worry about is uh, if you put something behind a sidewalk and some driver happens to come that way, the, motor, the pedestrians have no place to go. You'd like to have some clear space so they can at least get out of the way. 
Uh, we did some crash evaluation on the street. I got some information from uh, Wisconsin DOT through the university, and there are 10 out of 90 some accidents, 55 of them were not at Carmichael. 10 of them were f f uh, people that ran off the road and hit a fixed object. I think your light poles go down quite frequently. Uh, the, uh, on, this other, on the south side, you've got about 24 to 28 feet between the edge of the pavement and the rock cut. The other thing is, if you remember when we looked at cut the intersection of Carmichael and Hanley, when the university wanted to get some parking over at the Wisconsin uh, Credit Union in their parking lot, we discouraged that because of a number of issues, and I'll, I'll catch in, I'll get into that in a little bit. I'd also like to say, uh, I've got, I tried to anticipate all the questions that you might have, and so hopefully by the time we get to the end, you won't have much of any questions, but if you do at the end, we'll answer anything. I'll be here as long as you have to have me. Uh, but hopefully we'll have covered most everything and you can have a good discussion on it. The third thing we might be able to do is reduce the lanes. Go from that four lane section to something other than four lanes, like the three lanes or two lanes uh, with left turn lanes at certain locations. That four lane was common back in the 1960s when, the, you know, when a lot of these roads were built and we carried on until we came up with uh, something that a lot of people are now talking about, I think some of you have seen the article on complete streets. Uh, that's actually something in the law now it says you have to consider these things. Uh, they call them road diets, they call them multi-mode multi streets, there's all kinds of names for them. Uh, we've been doing it since the, when I started in the 60s and I used to call it common sense. You huh. just basically design the road for the people who are going to use it, whether they're on a bike, whether they're on foot, or whether they're in a car, and what type of trucks they have. So. You just need to anticipate what's going to be there. We look at the conversion. If you convert Hanley Road to basically three lanes, one through lane in each direction and something in the middle, uh, you could usually use that middle at all the intersections to develop left turn lanes. None exist there today. There are no left turn lanes in that whole section. Uh, so you, you would have the opportunity to, to add them. The benefits are pretty obvious. I don't have to go through them all, but the stop left turn vehicles are not in the through lane of traffic. You don't have to look in your mirror to see who's going to run into you. You also aren't under pressure then to make a, accept a gap in traffic that's a little shorter than you should so you can get out of the way. And if you watch cars, they want to get away from it. I make a left turn off a county road into my driveway and there are times when I see a car behind me too close, I'll pull off to the right and wait till they all go by and then pull back out. You just have to worry about them. Uh, so there's less stress for them. Also, when you get to a left turn lane in the middle and you only have one lane of traffic coming at you, you can see the opposing traffic. If you're turning out of the left lane and have two lanes coming at you, you don't know what's behind that truck in the left lane. Uh, the left turns from the cross street or left turns that are being made off of there are only have to cross one lane rather than two lanes. And then you also have that, like we talked about, the eye-to-eye -eye visibility with pedestrians. It's much easier from a single lane than from two lanes. The one concern is, and if, if you've been on Main Street and River Falls, that used to be four lanes. We converted that to three lanes and it's been very successful in every term uh, in terms of crashes, in terms of everything. There's a little more delay for cross-street traffic because we now have everybody in one lane instead of two side by side. Uh, but uh, it hasn't been anything that has created unacceptable un uh, delays. You have right turn lanes there that are at four intersections. Uh, in if you include that eastbound 35, Highway 35 turn lane, those would all stay there, so there's no impact on that. But if we, uh, to benefit the right turn lanes, uh, if sideswipe and left turn lanes, if sideswipe accidents are reduced, and there were, I think, about 10 sites or 12 side swipes in that collection of 55 accidents that we, we had. But one of the concerns about right turn lanes is they can only be made from the only through lane rather than from one of the right turn lanes. I mean, from the right through lane. If you have two lanes, you can get in the right turn lane and people can pass you on the left. The bad thing is when you slow down to make a right turn, everybody jumps to the left lane. And there's a lot of side swipes that are caused by that. 
Uh, large trucks might have a little bit more of a problem turning out or on, but that center lane is usually unoccupied. You don't have a high volume left turn lane anywhere, so that's not going to be much of a problem. And no matter what we do, there's always uh, what we kindly call idiots who are, have driver's licenses who will do all kinds of funny maneuvers. I often say, think about the dumbest kid in your ninth grade class and remember he's got a driver's license. Pedestrians, the four lane, crossing the four lane right now, uh, they have a trail and sidewalk along one side, but if you want to go from the, from the east side of Highway 35, you've got to cross the road twice. Uh, so you're, you're crossing four lanes twice. Uh, the, they have to cross four lanes in one crossing, as I mentioned before, so you look this way, look at two, and then you look the other way and try to figure out what those two are. And then you got to look back to make sure that those first two cars are really doing what you thought, and so you look back and forth and then you go unless you're very courageous and assume that you can step out and that everybody will stop. Uh, and then I mentioned before you could hide it, hide a pedestrian behind a vehicle in the other lane of traffic if there's a car there. With the three lane concept they only have to cross one lane at a time. That center lane with the left turn lane you don't have a high volume so they usually can get into the center lane and then if something occurs in the opposite lane you have a little bit of a of refuge area. Um, the left turn lane is is uh, seldom occupied so you, you don't really have to worry too much but that left turn vehicle will be going slow and definitely is going to see you there. Uh, you'll have a few fewer gaps in traffic to cross, but if you mark the crosswalk and if we make it a good crosswalk, you will get gaps because there's only one lane of traffic that you have to stop in each direction. We found, I can't prove it, but we found that drivers are more likely to yield in a single lane and in a double lane because when you're driving along, are you going to be the one that's going to stop and then you wonder, is the other driver going to or is he going through? And if he's not going to stop, I'm not going to stop and you have that type of a problem. And then that sight distance is improved. On a current four lane there, if you've driven it, and I think one of the things that the people complain about is people are driving more than 40 miles an hour. Uh, if you want to have fun, drive the speed limit anywhere and see how many cars will pass you on a four lane roadway. Uh, try going 65 on, on your way to River Falls and, <laughs> and you'll see that they go flying by you. If, they, if you're only in one lane, they can't fly by you. You kind of control them. Uh, you have some slow moving trucks in a single lane they're going to create a little bit of a problem until they either accelerate to the speed or to complete their slowdown. This is not a trip to Chicago, this is only a couple miles long and so it's not going to be a great inconvenience. We have competition on four lanes. Uh, if you don't believe that, watch go people going down the hill in the morning and see how many people go down the left lane and dive into a gap and they get right down around Pearson so they can get three cars ahead as they make the right turn and go north. I guarantee if you're there 10 minutes, you'll see a couple of them. Uh, left turning vehicles, vehicle slows down, car number one behind them swerves over, car number two is going too fast and runs into them. It occurs a lot. And then the, the biggest concern is not the speed, but the speed differential in traffic. If we had everybody going 43 miles an hour on that road, it'd be pretty safe. But instead, we got some going 40 and some going 50. And that speed differential causes side swipes, it causes rear ends, it causes all kinds of crashes. With the three lane, the slowest vehicle sets a pace. The speed differential is significantly reduced. We've done some speed checks on some of these uh, four to three lane conf conversions and we see a speed reductions of up to three miles per hour and that's overall general speed. But as I mentioned you do have some trucks that will will slow down traffic maybe below what people want to travel and uh, you don't have a lot of trucks that go up that hill you have the mining trucks but there aren't a lot of others most of them come in at 35 but the trucks going up the hill are going to be slowing down traffic. I'm not sure that that's a problem. Four lanes can handle about to, up to about 22,000 cars a day. A three lane handles about 18,000. Uh, I don't think you, this is more for reference. Uh, you have some other things that affect capacity, but basically that's the capacity. And your current traffic out there is about 11,000 vehicles a day. 
We've done some homework uh, for the Carmichael study on where traffic is going to be growing and not a lot of it will be coming from Hanley. You're going to get about 7% of the traffic coming out of St. Croix Metals that will use Hanley to get over the 35. That's not going to create a major jump in traffic. The business park is about 90% developed, so you're not going to generate a lot more. Uline took and, and pretty well filled that up. Uh, not many home spaces left. Uh, you go across on the east side and there's some residential area there, but, but basically Hanley runs right into an, a pretty well established uh, number of nice homes. So you're not going to get a lot more traffic on Hanley, so you can, you're not going to have a capacity problem with only three lanes. Uh, two other things to think about is if you go down by Carmichael and you watch traffic as they begin to go up the hill, there's only one lane of traffic that can come onto the street at a time. There's only a single southbound left turn. There's only a single eastbound movement that comes across from the west side. There's only a single northbound lane. So they're in one lane at the bottom of the hill and you're not going to add a lot more anywhere else. So we got the one lane of capacity and we only have one lane coming out of the roundabout plus the southbound lane, which is about uh, 2,400 cars a day. So we don't have a lot of demand for more capacity because we can only put so many cars into that section. So first off, we don't project much traffic growth. And secondly, they can only be in one lane to start. So they could probably stay in it without a problem. I mentioned delays. The crashes should de decrease, the side swipe should, you know, I say side swipe opportunities because that's what it is. Somebody makes a dumb move and they crash into a, another car. Left turning vehicles are much, much safer. Uh, one of the concerns is that there's some distance between the left turn lanes and that would be a painted crosshatched area. That's one of the, the probably one of the great options. You have something like that on the five lane section on stage line. You, have, you can see it in other cities around here where they have the, the three lane. We also can do some traffic calming in conjunction with that three lane section and further reduce the, uh, I'll say the speeds, the higher speeds. Uh, we're having a little design problem on westbound lanes coming from Highway 35 and we're going to have to do some, some good work with WSDOT to take care of that. Uh, the area I mentioned between intersections, we've got some options and then that uphill traffic concern. We can put a median island in at the crosswalks, even with the left turn lanes. There's room, I have a cross section I can show you. So we'd have one lane, for instance, at O'Neill, we'd have one lane going westbound. We'd have a, 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 about an eight foot cross or a median island, raised median. And we'd have a left turn lane and a through lane for eastbound traffic. They'll fit within the curb section. So we don't change the curb width, we don't have to widen, they'll fit right in. That means that the, the, there's a benefit there to anybody that's crossing the street, they only have to cross one lane, then they are on a median island. The median island is wide enough for a bike or, or I used to call them baby strollers, I think you call them something different now. But it, it, strollers, yes. So anyhow, you've got a, an area there and then you've got a left turn lane and another through lane. So you can pretty well divide up your crossing into two sections. Also, when you put a median out there, the motorist is going to have more awareness that there's something occurring up there and they're going to be more alert to pedestrians. It also, uh, because it's a little narrower, will tend to reduce speeds. We've got some documentation that shows that. We've done traffic calming with a median. The one concern is, as we now have to sweep or plow snow or do something off of them, but uh, it's a short median island and if we don't clutter it up too much, they can do it mechanically. Uh, the other thing is, if you wanted to try and put a bicycle lane in with this three lane section, it would not fit past the, uh, that, the median island and the crossing. And I say it's maybe a benefit, I'll show you in a minute why I don't think putting a bike lane on Hanley is a great idea. If you have a bike, if you ride a bike down Hanley Avenue, I think you're at risk on any four lane road. You're at risk because you're in a lane of traffic and if somebody switches lanes and all of a sudden you're in front of them, you're, you're in trouble. Uh, if your bike riders on Hanley Road under the three lane concept, you have a heavy volume of traffic and so the bike rider is going to be next to trucks periodically. 
If you've been up in Superior, they had a street where they say trucks use center lane because it's too close to the sidewalk trail section that they have. Trucks, trucks create a problem of both the, the wind velocity and then they have these mirrors that hang out. Um, you have some speeds and no matter what we do, going down the hill and the rock cut is going to be a little higher than 40. It's going to be impossible to keep them down to that. But you have bikes that are going to go down the hill and they're going to go down fast. And as they go down fast, they're going to end up in that area where the right turn lanes are at uh, both Pearson and at Carmichael. And we don't have a good solution for what to do with a bike rider. If we put them on the outside of the bike of the right turn lane, then they have to come back out and they're, and that has not proven to be a very remarkable idea. If you've gone north on Wisconsin, as it gets up to Vine Street, you see that we have took and put the bike lane out on the left side of the right turn lane. It's between the two. And that works good on that low-speed roadway coming up to a stop sign. Uh, it hasn't always worked out that good when you get a higher-speed roadway or a higher-volume right turn. So it's, it's, uh, I have concern about a bike going down the hill there. But the other thing is uh, when they get down there, you have to somehow get them across Carmichael, and, and we've talked about that before with the Carmichael-Hanley study. It's not a good, not good corner to cross from. Um, so my bottom line there is that a trail would, would, a trail would be available the entire length and will be safer then the alternative would be the safer alternative as opposed to trying to put a bike lane on Hanley Avenue. The other thing is if you look at the destinations of the bikes and pedestrians and go to schools, but they have to get out and use Carmichael, they can go to parks, but they have to go up and down Carmichael to get to any of the parks. You have one park south or two parks. One of them is right in the Red Cedar Canyon area. Uh, Recreational facilities are basically north of 94, so you're back again using that west side of Carmichael Road, or eventually the ball field is going to draw traffic to one down in St. Croix Meadows, but the trail down there is on the west side down the Albert Street. Uh, convenience stores, fast food stores, with the exception of maybe Chipotle, everything is on the west side. And so for destinations, almost everything you want to get to, you have to go to the west side and cross Carmichael at some point. If you look at recreation, which is where more of the bike riders are now coming from, you, you have the internal system in Red Canyon, you got a lot of good sidewalks in there. Uh, if you wanted to go to anything on the west side, or you want to connect up to your system up uh, that runs along the South Frontage Road along Crestview, you have to get on the west side of Carmichael. Same way if you want to go south, you get on the west side of Carmichael. Uh, Hanley Road has a bike trail that only goes west to Navacagan, and that's on the south side. And on the south side, it's on the south side going through the roundabout. So everything says you want your bike rider to be on the south side, not on the north side. And I, I'll just briefly re go through the Carmichael intersection again. You've got a real heavy southbound left turn, and so. If anybody is crossing in that southbound crosswalk, they, they have to cross past that southbound left turn. Well, they got the red light, so they're stopped. But if you're in the east crosswalk, that left turning car is focused on somebody coming at them, and they don't look at the southbound, at the crosswalk on the east side. All you have to do is drive through the area yourself and see what you're focused on. And that usually is one of the problems when we have uh, pedestrians getting hit in crosswalks is deterring traffic. The same thing goes for the east or the westbound right turn. They have a free flow. We could even get rid of the free flow, but there's a heavy volume making a right turn, whether it be on a red light as part of the intersection if we took the island out or whether they go through that island. Same way with the right turn traffic. They're looking to the south to see where their gap in traffic is. And somebody on the north side entering that crosswalk is not very well seen to them. Uh, and if we take the island out, uh, and say, well, now they don't have the free flow. Well, the, if you watch an intersection where there's a heavy right turn, those folks are always interested in seeing who's there and when can I make my turn and go. So it's unfortunate, but that's, that's the way drivers seem to react. So with those heavy volumes of traffic, uh, we've, 
we are very concerned that if you try and run pedestrians or bikes through that, that they're going to be at risk. The trails are on the west and south sides of the street, uh, and that if you have the if you try and put somebody on the north side, they still have to cross one of those streets to get to it. And so a comment I'd like to put out there for you to think about is that the safest route for bike riders or pedestrians between the Red Canyon, Red Cedar Canyon area or anything to the east and a Carmichael Road trail is to use the south side of Hanley Road and use your existing trail. Uh, if you convert Chanley Road to three lanes, there's a number of possible sections. You could do two lanes with a center left turn and an edge lane, edge line. You could try and narrow the road by moving the curb line. Uh, you could put median island at the crosswalks and for traffic calming, or you could put a median the full length. If you tried to move the curb line, you could reduce the lane widths. You could get rid of that edge line area. Uh, and you could reduce the amount of paint that would be in the center for that center lane. The whole problem is uh, you don't have any funding. You got curb replacement in the, the project coming up, but it's only from O'Neill West. So you're into a whole lot more new curb replacement. You need to full 52 feet with the crosswalks, and we've got crosswalks proposed for three locations, so it looked like an accordion road going back and forth with widths, and it wouldn't really work that well. With a narrow road, you have to think about uh, disabled vehicles, especially going up the hill. I think Tuesday, if you saw trucks going up a hill anywhere in the metro area, you saw the problem of a truck trying to get up the hill. You got to move catch basins. You got to move street lights. Most of that stuff is in rock. The street lights are down on about four feet, and then they're in rock. I mean, they're in rock all the way drilled down. All the cables come in through pipes into the, that. So you're into a quite an expensive movement to do that. Um, so it's, it, if you wanted to reduce it, you would get much benefit, but you'd sure incur a lot of costs. This would show a, a typical it probably doesn't show up as well on your drawing, and I apologize for that. But it basically shows three 14-foot lanes, three foot outside towards the, the gutter line, and then a two-foot gutter. It would be only three feet wide, which would discourage all but uh, the, the uh, which I call them the spandex-type bike riders that want to bike on the road regardless of what you do. Uh, I might discourage them and put them on the trail. I would definitely take a novice or a family group and put them out there. And the lanes are adequate width. Uh, the left turns would have 14 feet, which is what you probably want with the number of semis that you have turning at some of those locations. Uh, the two-foot gutter standard. Uh, you could also put a median in and just put in that 14 feet in the middle and have 17 feet. But now you're talking of a concern about uh, the trucks, emergency vehicles, et cetera, that would have to get by somebody and only only 17, actually 19 feet with the gutter. We have that section on Cascade in front of the university in River Falls, and we've had them sneak by disabled vehicles, but it's very slow. Uh, but it, it's, it works in that slow speed, and it's only a block at a block by block. Uh, you also have to figure out what you want to do with that median, which means you're going to pay a lot of money to put the median in, and then you have to figure out what you can, how you're going to handle drainage, and do you just want a slab of concrete? It might help with traffic calming, but not as much as if sporadic uh, median islands would. And this is what I talked about in the pedestrian crossing section. If you go from the left side, you can see that we've got a 16-foot lane going which would be westbound at uh, O'Neill, a 10-foot median, actually probably end up at 8 feet, and then 12, you know, 12 plus a gutter on the other on the, for the through lane. So it's, there's adequate room through there, and you can see that it looks pretty safe. Uh, I mentioned about the, the benefits with the wide median, uh, traffic calming. You got a general purpose trail. Uh, the trail is eight foot wide. Uh, you could add a section of trail between O'Neill and Heritage on the south side for continuity, but not with this project. It would probably be something in the future. 
The new St. Croix County bike plan that came out did not show any connections for Hanley. It did show some additional connections in Hudson going north towards the Willow River. Uh, they had one that connected to uh, Rivercrest School, uh, but they didn't show anything being of county significance. They showed one going out uh, on County Road N. So there's, there's no, no major plans for that. This shows the sketch at O'Neill Road. Uh, the crosswalks moved a little bit to the west of the intersection so that it leads directly to a curb rather than to a radius. The curbs uh, would be, the, the ramps for the crosswalk would be ADA compliant. Uh, they would be very easy to use for bicycles, for handicapped people, for any kind of pedestrian. And it uh, it's, you can see it pretty much establishes it as an intersection rather than just a spot in the road where you might find left turns. This is a sketch of Carmichael and Maxwell. It shows how we could build some left turn lanes in for both directions leading up to that Pearson-Maxwell intersection. It also shows a, a westbound left turn at Carmichael. That was a recommendation that came out of the St. Croix Metal study and also uh, will be in the Carmichael Road Corridor study recommendations. In the middle of the area, right where it's Canyon and Rock, Canyon Drive and Rock Street, uh, we'd put a little median in the middle just uh, to separate traffic, to be just there for traffic calming. There's no pedestrian crossing involved, but it would be midpoint between the other two medians. And this is over at Heritage where you also have that crossing from the south to north coming out of the roundabout area. Same thing, same section. Uh, so it, it would work quite nicely. So our finally, final comments, uh, it's an opportunity to develop a complete streets design. You've, we recognize where we can put pedestrians, bicycles. We've, we've tried to take care of the turning trucks. We've tried to make it safe for the motorists. Uh, the safest bicycle pedestrian route is a trail, not on the street. And three lanes of traffic calming, with traffic calming, addresses all the concerns and three lanes has had enough capacity for the future. So I went well over my hurry up and get it done limits, but <laughs> I think I got a lot of information out in front of you. You did. Thank you, Glenn. Questions? Uh, Glenn, will the speed limit change? No, I, I don't. We haven't talked about it, but I says the 40 is probably a reasonable speed if we can get everybody going 40. Do you have a general idea of how much median islands cost to install? A um, lot. Again, the plans are being developed as as, as we speak, uh, and again, we're trying to shoot for a approval of the final design and bidding documents at the end of January. So, taking a look, I got a couple of rough, uh, some preliminary cost estimates and. To move from a four lane to a three lane and add three raised islands, one would be at Heritage, per the sketch you just saw, the short one at in between Rock Street and Canyon Drive, and the third one being at O'Neill. So for just those three islands, uh, as well as changing from four to three on the paint, because we'd have a substantial amount of cross hatching, uh, for example, through the rock cut, you'd have, whoops, excuse me, through the rock cut, you'd have a cross hatch all the way through there and then down at Pearson or excuse me at Maxwell Drive and Carmichael that lane configuration would all be paint we're, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty to sixty thousand dollars now if you look at our project our total project is pushing nine hundred thousand dollars so somewhere in the five to seven percent uh, again and we're in the preliminary stages those estimates are preliminary to continue on our current schedule we would have bidding documents at the end of January typically what comes with those documents is what we refer to as an <coughs> engineer's estimate so the consultant would actually have an estimate of construction at that time based on the plans which would be a better estimate than the one we have now tonight and then of course following that we would advertise it and actually open bids and take bids from contractors and then at that point we'd have 
more or less what the, what the real construction costs would be. But so you're 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 from uh, the preliminary estimates is you would be talking somewhere in the fifty, uh, 50 to sixty thousand again for those th three raised median intersections and paint to establish the four lane to three lane revision on the whole project length. And the only potential, I don't want to say glitch, but and Glenn referred to it as the easterly portion of our project. Technically, the city right-of-way stops just west of Heritage Boulevard. So from just west of that intersection to the roundabouts is technically DOT right-of-way. So our original uh, mill and overlay would have stopped somewhere right in there, so we'd have to get their approval, uh, which we think these sections make sense. We think the lane configuration age configurations make sense, so we don't don't see that as a problem, and we would literally have uh, probably from now until, say, construction start up in May, um, to to meet with the DOT and address any of their concerns and hopefully get their approval in in that uh, five six month period of time. Glenn, um, is it easier for a left turning? driver from a side street to cross the four lanes or the, the three lane configuration? It's easier with three lanes because you're only trying to look for a gap in each direction. You can see all the cars coming at you with the four lane you don't know who's hiding behind one of those cars. You have less gaps but you know where the gaps are. You're not guessing that there's a gap and finding out there isn't. Hmm. So well, safer that, but longer. Yeah. That's a huge problem at Maxwell and Pearson, right? Isn't that the problem now? Yeah. It's scary. Yeah, I mean, it is. Yeah. Um, would the um, the crosswalks have lights by them to warn drivers, or how is that going to work? Uh, I'm not. What I we talked about that, and, and what I suggest is that you don't put them in initially, but you wait and see how many users you get. You don't have many users on that trail now. And one of the concerns we have with those rectangular lights with the signs is that if you start putting them in at intersections where nobody is, or they're infrequent, that's going to diminish where you put them in where there's a lot of traffic. And so we, we suggest you don't do that, but, in, but do put in pedestrian crossing signs, the rectangular passive signs, and mark the crosswalk so that in, with, the, with the single lane each direction, it'll be very apparent to the motorists. So obviously there's a lot of thought that's gone into this and there would be a lot of planning money that would go into this. Um, a couple of concerns that I have and you've addressed it to some extent is the capacity and density of, uh, of the traffic that's coming. So we're funneling that down to one lane on each side and as you mentioned there are going to be fewer gaps. So how difficult is it going to be for people to, to be making left turns across that other lane, finding that gap in order to be able to make that turn? We've, uh, I'll give you River Falls as an example. I think their volume up at the north end is now around 16,000 or 15,000. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember. And you're only at about 11,000. Currently. Currently. Any and you probably won't get more than another 1,000 or 1,500. Okay. Uh, even even with development down at the dog track, yeah, we've that dog track is going to generate traffic. But we came up with a determination of which direction traffic would go, and their consultant did, and we matched at about seven percent. So seven percent of the dog track traffic will end up on Hanley, mm -hmm. uh, which won't add a lot, and a lot of that traffic uh, might be ballpark or other. Well, some of it will be office related, but it should be off peak. So, uh, there any consideration at all to potential annexation going out toward exit four and what that might do to traffic flow on Henley? Uh, going which direction, south or east? Going east. East. We looked at the volume that might come out of the undeveloped parcels between old 35 and new 35, and we've, we've got some numbers in for the Carmichael study, trying to figure out if that's going to impact. Uh, from what we've we believe, a lot of the the development will go that will go further east will use exit four, the Highway 12 interchange, or not come any further east than the roundabouts on 
Hanley and use 35. Was there a, a I, I may have missed it, we're going to add right turn lanes. It would seem like in some places that that, that would be very helpful, particularly turning into the, uh, um, the industrial park. It would be helpful, but uh, we didn't look at that because this was essentially mill and overlay and, and curbs in place or narrowing. Right. Uh, it's something you could add, but it would be another cost. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it would seem like it would... No, it doesn't. <laughs> it actually lets traffic speed up. But uh, that's one of the issues now is that, you know, with two lanes, somebody's always turning right and you're trying to... Is that guy turning or is there someone behind him when you're coming out, mm -hmm. of, out of there? It's a... Yeah, the right turn lane would be a benefit rather than a detriment. Uh, having Across. the right turns out of the right lane and having two <coughs> lanes of traffic behind is actually uh, probably a worse scenario because of all the lane switching and the hiding of cars by trucks, et cetera. The, the right turn lane is also going to probably end up moving a couple light poles and, and I don't know, catch basins might be in there too. So it's not just great. A, a big tower or power station up on the uh, on the east side, that that road that actually blocks your vision. You can't even see the cars coming, but uh, that would have to be moved. So it's if I recall, you got this pond right. Oops, got to get back to it. But there's a big pond uh, that's right in it across from uh, Canyon Drive, and uh, right next to Rock. So that would be a problem for a right turn. You're, it might be something uh, you could look at, but again, it'd be a funding situation as much as anything. It would be a, this would be the opportunity, the time to do that, I would think, as opposed to, oh, it could be, it could be done later. It would be no, doesn't have to affect the project. I'm sorry, what? It could be done later. It doesn't have to affect the project. Well, it would be nice to do it with well, it because it uh, you wouldn't have a seam there in the bituminous, and your, your cost would probably be cheaper. But you uh, you have to think about the, about the dollar amount, the curbs, your moon curb, and everything. Yeah. Well, I think we should look at doing this right, fixing it, and that would be one of the one of the things that's really going to help move smooth the traffic out and move allow it to move along, keep people from passing into the the middle lane. Mm -hmm. All the probably most that beneficial if we could identify where the trucks are turning because uh, they turn the most probably. Most of the trucks, though, seem to be coming from the east. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's but then it's cars coming from the west. Yeah. On O'Neill, it looks like there's room for a right turn lane from Hanley on to O'Neill. Might be worth considering. Because a lot of people are getting off to go into the business park yeah. at, at that spot. Well, I think, Tom, in the grand scheme of things, besides a full reconstruct, this is the time to do it. Fifty to 60000 for these median islands or what you laid out, Glenn, yep. to me is a minimal cost for what we're trying to, because this has come to public safety now for the last six months or even, even longer about the, the speeds up there. And as those houses develop more up there, there's more traffic coming through and crossing. Uh, pedestrians crossing so uh, this would be the time to me to add a minimal amount to the overall price tag of what we're doing up there now you add a right turn lane that's a little bit more significant than the islands and the the paint but I would support moving forward with something like that now rather than wait I haven't heard anything about discussions with any of the the tenants over there in the business park so I presume none have been had yet. Uh, are we going to be looking for input from Uline, from General Motors, Monarch, uh, Valley? Um, we did have a couple of emails back and forth, and I responded to one from the Red Cedar Canyon Association. Uh, staff has discussed the business park, the Ulines and those, and we were planning on uh, Getting the word out in some form of probably a letter or whatnot, we probably would call somebody as large as Uline and set up a sit-down face-to-face meeting and explain to them what our plan uh, plans are. But we did definitely plan on meeting with the larger uh, businesses out there and then in, in noticing, uh, sending out some sort of notice on the other ones. So that was our intent. Uh, 
and typically like our other street projects in the last few years uh, once we do get closer to opening bids and awarding a contract we typically have a public informational meeting at that time when we get a little bit closer uh, to construction to go over people's concerns on how the construction is going to happen relative to things like schedules detours uh, disruption those kinds of kinds of things but to answer your question yes we were going to contact them okay. and what is it you're looking for tonight anything in particular or well I guess from tonight um, other than the discussion on their adding right turn lanes there's two potential I see O'Neill going south and then there's another rock street going south I don't know that again you could it's a money situation you could add it but that is something that you could add a right turn lanes uh, to those streets at a later date uh, so for tonight as far as direction from the council I guess the most of the presentation centered around is it a valid revision to go from a four lane existing street to a three lane with the center lefts mm -hmm. and in this case with that the three raised medians would also be protected lefts at those three locations and the estimated cost being somewhere in the fifty to sixty thousand dollar range so the direction would be either yes or no on going forward with with that uh, as far as finishing our plans and getting into the bidding okay so that's whether we should go that direction or the other direction I suppose would be maintain the roadway four lane design like it is now and again to, just to back up just a tad is this was kind of our maintenance style project uh, bill and overlays are usually maintenance the more types of things like this you start doing you get from the situation where you're in a maintenance project which is maintenance dollars into reconstruct project and reconstruct projects are always more money the addition of the islands is relatively easy to do from a design standpoint you have a crown roadway we can add those things in the middle without I don't think we're going to get uh, bound, uh, bound, caught up with a whole bunch of additional storm sewer or we aren't moving street lights we aren't so from a cost benefits uh, analysis type of thing you can get pretty much good bang for the buck I, I know the fifty sixty thousand dollars is kind of a large number but I think, it, and especially if you go to Glenn's PowerPoint, there's quite a bit of advantageous items relative to traffic calming, slowing traffic down, safety, adding those left turn lanes. So, but that would be the direction: do we go with the three lanes and the raised islands, or maintain the existing? Okay. Well, I would move that we go with the three lane concept and look at where we could put, in addition, look at where we could put in right turn lanes to smooth the traffic out. I think at the bottom of the hill, uh, right turn lanes might be advantageous. That's that's a, I don't that's a messy situation down there, and I don't know that this is going to help yeah, that. Thirty right, right, right turn, lane turn lanes there. at Pearson and Carmichael. Yeah, sir, it doesn't feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got them there, and we'd keep them there at Pearson, uh, yep. Maxwell. All right, we got a motion. I'll second that. Got a motion a second. You know, I, I don't know that I got the answer to this or not, Glenn and Tom, but again, one of the concerns that I have, probably the biggest concern I have, you're obviously going to have the discussions with the uh, tenants over there at the business park, but again, if there's heavy concentration, especially during peak traffic hours, heavy concentration that's all going down to funnel down that would be just one lane, people that are trying to take a left turn coming out of, let's say, Red Cedar Canyon, uh, during those periods as you pointed out there are fewer gaps I'm, I'm a little nervous about whether that's going to really stall traffic there trying to get out onto Hanley and um, <clears throat> and if there's any thought to what the remedy might be if in fact that happens as it comes to fruition that they do have problems coming out of there I haven't spent a lot of time up there watching traffic I don't have traffic counts but I've been there in the rush hour, and there are some delays currently coming, especially south on uh, O'Neill. But usually they're probably less than you get at a traffic signal trying to get on a Carmichael yeah. or some of the others. So they seem long, but if you put a stopwatch on it, they're probably not long, and I don't think it's going to grow exponentially. Uh, but it's going to be a longer. It's going to seem longer. On the other hand, you're going to get platoons of traffic because you'll get the slowest car leading. I get it. And so you might 
that might offset it, assuming that you get a platoon, that you don't get a platoon and a platoon and a platoon and so on. So my, my bottom line guess is you're gonna, some people are gonna complain, but overall, they're gonna like it. That's what's happened to River Falls. That's what happened to a lot of the, the conversions that have been done. Well, just so that we're thinking ahead that if that does happen, that we have some remedy in, in, in mind. The one thing that you, you can always look to is, is uh, some type of traffic control. You would not want to do a four-way stop. That would just kill the road. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, ever got to a point where, say, you were having a lot of problems with traffic coming out of Rock and coming south out of the, uh, the Red Rock, Red Cedar, the, the group up north, uh, you could always try and combine an intersection. One of the thoughts that we had was it, eventually mining is going to end up coming out of there, and you could take O'Neill South and curve it over to combine to a common intersection with O'Neill North and make that a major intersection. Well, you could put it around about there. Yeah, if you convert could. this all down to single lane, it would be an <coughs> obvious yeah. round, roundabout yeah. situation. But as long as we're thinking about it, right? I, I see what you're saying. So I would like to um, like to also get some input from the neighbors over there on that in particular. Uh, but um, the, the Red Cedar Canyon neighbors, yeah, and uh, Heritage Green. On this concept. Well, right. On, well, on, on <coughs> if they think they're, they may have a problem, I don't know how many people out of there take a left, uh, but there are certainly going to be some that are going to be heading over to 35 from there. And I, I just don't want that bottled up trying to get out of Red Cedar Canyon. It's not a big, big uh, uh, entryway into Red Cedar Canyon. I could see that could get bottled up pretty quick. I don't, I don't want to, I, I don't want to say it's not going to be a problem. I will say that the ones that have been completed have not ended up with problems. They've ended up with longer delays, and I want to make sure everybody understands that. But it's not going to be like going from 30 seconds to two and a half minutes. Okay. It's going to be an increment. All right. The other thing is uh, when we design these, as far as the, the uh, business park goes, we're trying to put the truck, the left turn lanes in there wide enough to accommodate the trucks, make sure that they're comfortable out there. And that usually is one of the biggest concerns trucks have is they have to slow down in traffic and they create a, a, a problem. And usually, unfortunately, they get involved in it. All right. Well, and those trucks are going to be right out in front of that entry or exit to Red Cedar Canyon, trying to take a turn into the, into the park. Tom, is there, uh, is there money in the project? to cover this or in the capital fund? Well, if we go back to the previous meetings, uh, I believe, you know, this is a little bit larger project dollar-wise than our, typically the city's been financing somewhere around 600,000 for mill and overlay and two or 250,000 of uh, maintenance projects, which are crack filling, seal coat. So we're in that eight, eight or nine hundred thousand dollar range this project was a little bit longer because in coming out of public works we discussed it about we were going to do um, more or less the in, instead of doing phase one the way it was built originally up to O'Neill and then from O'Neill we were going to do the whole thing if you recall and that's how it got from something from about eight hundred thousand and less project up to closer to nine so um, again that said um, if you look at the potentially fifty, sixty thousand dollars, is it five to six, seven percent more than our current estimate? Yes. Um, in talking with Brenda, between those two existing funds for 2018, and uh, again we we took some funds that were uh, not spent on Grandview, which was this year's project. That was an underrun type situation. We were within about thirty thousand dollars, I believe, of funding that entire nine hundred thousand. So, I'm not sure if there's another. Uh, I probably am using the wrong term, like reserve fund or something like that. <laughs> uh, but one other thing at this early stage too is, again, we were pleasantly surprised with our bids last year. Uh, last year's project had some of the cheapest asphalt prices we've seen in a lot of years. Uh, 
I would hope that we would get them same prices again. If we get those same prices, if we get those same prices, we can do this fifty thousand for sure. But I don't know that. And then with concrete, oil prices, those things tend to fluctuate year to year. So at this point, maybe we're going to get something that the money's uh, already in the current estimate. Uh, when we get closer to that engineer's estimate that we should have by say mid January or end of January, uh, maybe that will be a little bit different than our preliminary estimate because again that should be a little bit better because it's based on finished design and finished plans that are going out to bid. Uh, we could bring that back and have another discussion at Public Works and or Council uh, at that time. But okay. right. anybody else? Yeah, are the medians included in your um, motion, Jim? They're not, but they, they could be. I, I think it would be a smart idea to do that. Yeah, yeah. I thought they were. I thought they, I thought they were, too. I thought, yeah. I thought That's why that. I seconded the motion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 the corporate is saying I also that All right. I thought they were. <laughs> okay. Are right. you amending your motion, Jim? It's so amended. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? We're we're talking about the three mentioned. That's right. Okay. Three lanes. Right. Chief, you got something to say? Oh, well, and I guess just so I get clarification, we're talking about O'Neill Road at the west end of Hanley, right over by the water. O'Neill going north. Going north, correct. How come there's not one at O'Neill going south, especially right across from that senior living facility? There's a crosswalk that comes across there. I'm just saying, I'm just bringing this up because we might be hearing from them saying, well, why don't we have a median in there so that we can cross over to the south side? Or is it the plan to try to get them to go one direction or the other? That's, that, I'm all just bringing that up just for conversation. Um, we looked at that crosswalk and you can get to the crosswalk to the west. We tried to look at how many people from one side will want to get directly across to the other or do they want to just get to the trail and so we said let's just go to the three medians the three locations uh, we think that's enough to get the traffic calming to work and it gives almost every person that wants to make a trip a good route the only one that wouldn't have a good route route is somebody that works over there and lives in assisted lives in assisted living and works over in the business park Marty? No, I just wanted an explanation, that's all. Okay. Anybody else? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Oh, you know what? One thing, I apologize. Uh, Bill, as you all know, had sent out uh, an email to everybody. Uh, Tom, did you get this too? Uh, yes, I just put this up. Okay, so, and he, he wanted this as part of the record that he had had the conversation. Uh, with Glenn and Tom and uh, Mike Johnson and uh, it expresses some of his concerns some of which came up here tonight and so um, uh, obviously he would like to have been here tonight but wanted to get uh, apprised of everything that was going on given that this is in his district um, and uh, so if we could make sure that this is added to the minutes that, uh, that uh, he provided this with his concerns and his opinion on the project. So, is there a motion? Move to adjourn. Second. Got a motion, second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Stand adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Once again, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays to everybody. I don't think we're going to be together again until after. So